Hello everyone. So from here on, I will be explaining the surveillance, performance evaluation, and maintenance of the solar photovoltaic system. The cover picture was taken in Eswatini when I visited there to share our experience on the same topic. It is a 10 megawatt construction site. Eswatini had no previous experience in terms of solar energy site construction. Therefore, they were in urgent need of assistance in a post-construction examination. I will be using this example to explain how do we evaluate the performance by using the surveillance system and how to do further maintenance. So, my lecture today will be focused on the three topics shown on the screen. The surveillance system, performance evaluation, and equipment maintenance of the solar photovoltaic system. The background picture is actually a 3D model of a construction site of solar panel system which now actually exists in Taiwan. You may see the mountainous environment of the site from the 3D model. The 3D modeling is a very important step in whole process of construction planning. We examine some vital on-site factors such as shading and the distance between panels. The model also helps us to plan the structure for easier operation and maintenance according to the geographic feature. This is a special case in terms of location choosing. As you can see that the site is half surrounded by hills. It can only start generating power between 9 a.m until 4 or 5 p.m. due to the shadow caused by hills. This has severely affected the power generation efficiency. The other special factor of this site is that the construction was built upon the site full of waste gravels. It requires certain techniques to secure the basis on such crumbled ground. There is no such thing as a perfect design for all sites. We need to adjust and adapt to different scenarios every single time. And this example is a rather particular case. It had gone through a tough tendering process. There was basically nobody who would dare to take the business. Therefore, in the end, it was us, the Thai power, who took care of the construction ourselves. Thai power, also known as the TPC, is still the leader in such industry in Taiwan. Should any one of you have related questions or inquiries in future, you are all very welcome to contact us. I wouldn't say that we can always give out perfect answers, but relatively speaking, our solutions offered are the most trusted ones. Now, this is the basic introduction to our surveillance system. Before proceeding into the mechanical part, first, we discuss about what sort of things we need to keep an eye on with the surveillance system. For instance, the solar cell panel, inverter, and other parts of the network. For those parts which are not visible from the outside, we need surveillance system to detect the problems for us. For instance, we need ammeter to see electric current and voltage meter for voltage. 
Aside from this source of info, there are other equipment which need to be inspected. This is the solar cell panel. When it is working, we can see a curved line which indicates the output of electricity which goes up and down with the sun. This kind of data is provided exactly by the surveillance system, which usually can be found installed in the inverter, for the electric output must go through it. <coughs> this is the most basic and common setting. Of course, this is just part of the whole efficiency evaluation process. As you can see here on top, we also oversee the lightning rod when there are thunders. For more examples, we also keep an eye on the average temperature and the dust amount for the decision on how often we should clean the solar panels. This data are provided by our climate sensing units. Now, this white equipment is the very heart of the whole surveillance system, the solar emitter. As how the name literally means, the solar emitter oversees the total amount of sunshine received. After the solar emitter, the ammeter is another vital compartment of the system. It provides us info such as the output amount. We can get the performance ratio by calculating and comparing the numbers provided by solar emitter and ammeter, which is a very important indicator in site evaluation. Down here, you can also see the temperature sensors. By inspecting the temperature on site, we can have auxiliary data to examine the reason when the power generating efficiency is low. Is it because the panels are covered in dust? Or is it because the temperature got too high? We get our answers by examining all those data provided by this equipment. Since not all info provided by this equipment are digital, we would need an AI or DI converter to transform analog info into digital. The main server of the surveillance system's computer retrieved data from the solar panels, the shunt, inverter, and high voltage systems units, etc. The server can usually be found inside the surveillance system box, connected to the computer, and from the computer screen, we get to oversee the life status of all parts of our solar panel system. Aside from all this tangible data, there also are some situations which can't be detected by computers. For example, the structure damage caused by natural disasters such as typhoon or arson. What do we do then? We use surveillance cameras on site to keep an eye on such matters. We use them to observe and evaluate the status of the structures and to schedule maintenance work accordingly. Aside from the natural disasters, damages could also be caused by man-made factors. Here in Taiwan, Whenever the copper price rises, there would always be copper thieves sneak into our sites and damage the panel units. The on-site cameras could also detect such matter, inform us, and therefore we could call the police on time. 
as we enter the Da Wan Solar Power Power Farm, you may notice the mountainous ge geographic feature directly, which made the construction process really difficult. The power farm is situated in between hills and by a river. Usually, we need to dig the soil up for our construction. Yet, in this case, we couldn't, concerning the ecosystem of the river. Therefore, we built this power farm without the process of digging. It required lots of measuring and simulations before the construction. As you can see, the panel units are perfectly placed with calculated distance in between each units and the precise height to maximize the power generation. The, the efficacy is still quite good so far. The fenced area on the left hand side is the equipment area. The electric output from the panel is in DC current and it will be turned into AC current in the equipment area. Then the electricity would be transferred to the step up substation we just walked by to transform the low voltage current into high voltage AC current. Then the final production would enter the public electricity network for public usage. This is the basic working process of our energy farm. Now let's have a deeper look at the high voltage substation. Why do we need this substation? The amount of panels we have in a power farm is quite large. So does the total output. Hence, we need a substation to compress the electricity output into smaller amount of current by raising the voltage. When the electricity generated by panels comes into the substation, first, it goes through the MP panel. The MP panel contains circuit breakers through which the, the electricity goes to the transformer. Usually, we prefer using the amorphous metal transformers for their higher efficiency and lower energy loss. After the transformer, the current goes into the high voltage switch gear. Then it proceeds to the potential transformer, which detects and provides us the numbers we see on ammeters. Now this is the ammeter box and the disconnector. The disconnector serves as an isolating switch between our equipment and the public network. Usually, during operation, the disconnector just isolates the current. It doesn't cut it off completely. It is very dangerous if you open a box here during operation. If we need to cut off the whole current, we need to do it from the MP panel. Now we proceed to the solar emitter. As we have mentioned, the solar emitter is a vital part of the whole efficiency evaluation system. The solar emitter calculates how much sunshine our panels are absorbing. By comparing the light receiving rate with the number we got from ammeter, we can calculate the power generating efficiency. Now, this water blue display is the operational panel, from which we oversee the overall data of the power farm. 
As you can see on its screen, the current total generation is 36 kilowatts. The maximum generation rate of this machine can reach up to 100 kilowatts, which means the current generation rate is merely 36%. Now let's watch the video I recorded when visiting the leader in this industry, AUO. AUO doesn't just produce top quality solar panels. They also provide a full package service from investment, construction, and then to maintenance. Now I would like to show you how exactly their surveillance system works. So regarding the maintenance work, as you can see on the chart here, it appears to be showing only money, or more precisely, only numbers. Yet, it is the essence which includes our experiences, mechanism, and logic in maintenance work. Since there are a great number of power farm sites around the country, Every single day, we receive hundreds of thousands of error signals from the surveillance system. This kind of huge amount of data can be, pro can be processed manually. We must apply AI algorithm to sort and minimize the messages, then to pick the most important ones for us to handle. Hence, the simple numbers you see on this short chart. After years of operation and adjustment, the error detection rate of this system now is more than 99% accurate. The system informs us when the panels need to be cleaned and when there is problem occurring with fuses or wires or other problems such as output error. We can oversee and have control over the site simply by watching these charts. Later, when we arrive to the real site, I'll show you what, to, what do these numbers mean in reality. Okay, now this is the process map of data transmitting. It starts with collecting data from the equipment we just have seen in previous videos. Then the data would be transmitted to the computer on site and to our surveillance center as well for further analysis. Since the data is being transferred to a lot of places, the information security became a vital issue of our surveillance work. Therefore, in between every step, we show need protection such as firewalls, on-site servers, and computers. The servers on-site filter the huge amount of first-hand information coming from equipment for us which makes the job easier and secures the stability of data. Sometimes we control the system directly through intranet. Sometimes we connect it with other offices or public platform through internet. Sometimes the manufacturers of inverters provide such interface included as part of their product. Therefore, a, com a complete surveillance system generally provides the following functions and services. Data transmitting, data restoring, visualized interface, equipment maintenance, problem prevention, operational information, data management subsystem, file management subsystem, 
and user authorization management subsystem. Now this is the transmitting structure map of a surveillance system. The OT part indicates to the on-site network and the OA part corresponds to our offices and then the cloud storage services shown on the right end. The system structure I mentioned in previous slides was the traditional one which is connected by closed intranet. Usually we design such closed network case by case according to different situations of different sites. Not every single company has the capacity of doing this. For this reason, the inverter manufacturers usually include such basic default data transmitting network within their products for their customers to access the information easier and quicker. Yet, even though such services were provided by the original manufacturer, sometimes it's not as reliable as you think. The development of solar power industry is progressing on a really fast pace. For example, despite being a big brand, AVV actually struggling in running their solar power business. Hence, it is common to see companies developing specific surveillance system software now in the market for everyone who is in need to use. This kind of specialized software usually works better than the default system provided by inverter manufacturers. It applies to a wider range of different systems and usually has simpler interface. Most of these commercially available softwares tend to be more passive, which means we need to check the data every now and then proactively. A such inconveniency being revealed, proactive surveillance systems were born. Such softwares tell you what to do, when to do, and how to do. You don't have to check it all the time. Now, the most advanced way of doing such work is to directly outsource it to AI systems. For instance, AUO the, later, the leader of the industry, they chose to outsource such work to AI management. The automatic AI system con constantly learns from our experiences and optimizes its performance. Now, let's watch a video in which our colleague at Thai Power explains how our surveillance system works. This is the visual surveillance map of a 100 megawatt solar power site. Here we can see that the site is divided into 10 areas. There are weather data detectors equipped at both northern and southern end of the site. We can determine the condition of the site by observing the data for instance, the insulation duration, temperature and current power generating rate to decide if the site is working normally or is there any errors occurring. If we go deeper into the system, for example, here we can see the current status of each solar panel presented on screen. As you can see on the left hand side of the screen, the red blocks are the panels, and red color means they are functioning normally. If there's error, it'll become yellow. 
If the connection goes bad, it'll show another color to indicate it. So, now we're looking at one, 100 red blocks, which means 100 panels of the side are all good. If there's one going bad, we can simply click on the block and the detailed data of that single panel would be displayed on the right hand side of the screen listing out all the numbers also we can see the status of the panels by observing this kind of curve line chart these two charts show the power generating rate of two panels on 16th and 17th of June the blue line and green line represent the two panels I chose to compare. We can see if any one of them is having a lower power generating rate and decide if there's error. Then we can go on site to do further evaluation and fix it. We also have interviewed Chairman Lin of Yamasan Energy who is a leader in this industry to understand more about surveillance system. The surveillance system involves internet and we don't have control over the IPC company who controls the internet. Is the, sync, is the signal good? Are the equipment enough? Is the signal covering range wide enough? These are the most important factors which decides if a surveillance system works or not. Could you explain to us about how your company's surveillance system work, Manager Liu? We provide two kinds of surveillance systems. The first one is produced by ourselves. And the interface is quite simple as you can see on the screen. We can see all data including the power generating rate and operational conditions. These information blocks are like widgets on your smartphones. You may choose and edit what kind of information you would like to see first. Now if you need something more professional, you can go into this page to see all general data of all your power farms listed out. This interface is designed to be very user friendly. Now I would like to explain the efficiency evaluation, which we can divide into three parts. First, the positive. Second, the indifferent. And third, the negative and there's a fourth one which is that if we add some creativity and in innovative thoughts into the construction we can have infinite positive maximized opportunities firstly we talk about the situation when one plus one is bigger than two I'm giving you a most common example in Taiwan, aquaculture industry. Here is a very successful company in this field, which breeds marble gobbies. Let's see another video about it. Here we are at the Dongshan district of Tainan city, where the biggest re recirculating aquaculture farm in Taiwan is situated. The fish farm pool right next to me looks quite normal, isn't it? Yet the water is extra clean. I'm going to show you by throwing a $50 coin to the pool. Despite the pool is 1.2 meter deep, we can still directly see the coin I just put in through the camera. The water is super clean and not turbid at all because the fish living here have very high standard for clean water. 
the marble gobies. The marble gobies are origi originally from Southeast Asia and is a very expens expensive species in aquacultural industry. Usually, it costs 550 new Taiwanese dollars for 600 grams. Yet, due to the difficulty in breeding, usually we only see them in specific restaurants. You can't find them in markets. The person who built the whole marble gobby breeding empire is this Mr. Lian, who used to work in construction industry. He himself is from the Dongsan district and had seen how hard it was for the fish breeders to maintain their business. He always wanted to find a solution for this difficulty, and marble gobby, the species with high economic value, is the answer. Our water circulates constantly, 24-7, and then there is a filter tank which keeps the water as clean as possible. The water cleaning system in the farm which ensures the water quality is the key of his business, which makes the water recovery rate up to 95%. In this case, they only have to fully change the water once a year. Without chemical water quality controlling method, the breeding rate has raised from 0.006% up to 60 to 80%. On the other hand, we can see that the rooftop of the aquaculture farm is covered in solar energy panels, which lowers the indoor temperature and raises the power generation by 10%, according to the owner. There is another important step in the breeding work of the marble gobbies, which is to divide the fingerlings. What we have seen is the information about marble gobbies which are very expensive. The combination of aquaculture business with solar energy is a very good idea. Solar panels lower the indoor temperature for the fish and the water from the pools also help the panels to cool down. It is a mutually beneficial model. Now let's watch another related article about the Martian farm. When we talk about the crossover collaboration between greenhouse and solar energy, this mushroom greenhouse built by Power Master Group in Yunlin County is the best example. You can see in the picture that the mushrooms are very well grown. The Power Master Group imported the mushrooms from other countries, improved them, and then export them back. Maybe some of you have had attended the lecture provided by Powermaster Group since they also have done some lectures for our international allies. If you haven't, then you may search them on YouTube and find the related information. The collaboration between the agricultural work and solar energy business created great benefits. The PM Group also runs another organic vegetable farm, in which some special species of mountain vegetables do not need much sunshine to survive. Another successful case here is parking lot. Let's watch an example of an outlet mall called Mitsui. As you, as you may see on the main page of, the, of this website, the parking lot around the mall itself is totally covered by solar panel roofs. This is probably the biggest solar energy parking lot I've ever seen. Here on the website, it also shows that it has a capacity of 4.6 megawatts of power and reduces 3,349 tons of carbon dioxide emission annually. This kind of collaboration creates way more benefit than simple power farms, 
since the parking lot needed roofs and the panels do not just generate power, they also lower the temperature better than traditional metal rooftops. There is another case, which is disaster prevention solar power sites. For instance, emergency backup power for hospitals. Now let's talk about regular power farms, which the equation of the value is 1 plus 1 equals 2. This website belongs to another Taiwanese power company, in which they listed out the equations and methods regarding the efficiency calculation. The number of power generation divided by the number of insulation amount can get us an efficiency rate, which is PR. Here, the PR ratio is 90%, which is basically impossible in reality due to the regular power loss during transmission. Higher surface temperature of the panels actually lowers the power generation. The power loss also happens during current transformation and in the inverter. Therefore, the official top generation rate according to IEC is 88%. Unless you use auxiliary methods to improve the efficiency, for example, use water to cool the panels down or use better venting solutions. Now here comes question two. Why the PR rate usually doesn't reach the goal? The possible answer to this question are one, maybe these, the panels are dirty. Two, Perhaps the calculation went wrong. These odds needed to be checked on site first to make sure what exactly happened. Question 3. Sometimes the number provided by solar meter seems to be too low. Some unscrupulous companies might cheat by spread dust on the solar meter in order to get a higher PR rate for them to pass the acceptance check. Usually, the, cu the customers wouldn't find out until the PR rate goes over 100%. Other factors which affect the solar emitter can be the ubication where you set up the solar emitter. Question 4. There seems to be timing difference between the solar emitter's data and the power generation rate. Well, usually the difference is too little to be noticed. Question 5. Why does the PR rate go over 100? This is impossible under regular situations as we have mentioned. Question 6. Does the insulation go over a thousand watts per meter square? This happens quite a lot. In southern Taiwan, it usually goes up to a thousand and two hundred. Sometimes the PR rate may be referred as RA rate, which indicates to the data of the DC and of our units. The most common data we evaluate is the ESH equivalent sunshine hours. Why do we look at the ESH? Because it tells us how much power our units are generating in different time frames at your choice. This is why people always check the EHAs. Other than the EHAs, we tend to check things when error occurs. Now let's proceed to some negative examples. Sometimes the solar power site actually doesn't add any value, even reduces it. For example, if a site is being built at somewhere with bad weather condition, if the structure is not good enough, it could cost a lot just to maintain them. In this kind of cases, the benefit generated usually doesn't even cover the cost. Now let's move to the super positive cases, 
where there's infinite opportunities for positive outcomes. The example I'm giving here is the case of our own company, the coexisting mutual benefit model between cows and solar power system. This smaller cow over here is a male. We call him Da Zai, and the bigger cow is kind of shy. We're in Sui Li, Nantou, where two authentic Taiwanese cows, Da Zai and Wan Wan, being the best staffs of Da Wan Solar Power Farm. They eat up the grass first. As you can observe, that the grass around can grow this tall, which can cause shadow covering our solar panels. The shadows created great hot spots, which may damage the panels and affect the power generation. This location used to be an excavation wasteland field site of Ming Tan power plant also used to be shelter for victims of the 1999 Jiji earthquake. There are huge stones scattered everywhere under the 13 hectares of land, which makes the construction incre incredibly difficult. The tender failed for seven times in total. In the end, the Thai power decided to do, th to do it themselves. They have overcome all kinds of obstacles, saved 34 million Taiwanese dollars of budget, and managed to keep the, orig the original landscape. Originally, our budget was 70 million Taiwanese dollars, yet no one wanted to take over the tender. The 1,100 and 12 columns you see here were all built by me and my colleagues. First, we measure the elevation using the levels. After acquiring the data, we decide how tall should each panel be built in order to not shadow each other. With the aim to keep the original natural environment, they elevated the panels and built them on columns, and collaborated with the Livestock Research Institute. They have cows living right there at the solar power site to eat up the grass for them, creating a great example of collaboration between solar power industry and agriculture. We don't feel satisfied for our solar power plant to be just generating electricity. Before we started to keep cows, we spent 450,000 Taiwanese dollars within a year just on mowing services. But we don't have that cost anymore after the cows moved in here. These two cows may have costed us forty to fifty thousand dollars, but they saved four hundred and fifty for us. They have created the first example of cows co-working with solar panels by letting them eat up the grass. Apart from this, they also combine a power plant with tourism by constructing artworks with recycled insulators and panels. We have used the recycled insulators and fuel barrels to create the artworks alongside the road. That was the video about our collaboration with agriculture. If you put some innovation into your work, the efficiency can reach a whole new level. Now, Zhangbin Solar Power Farm, which is built by the coast, and so the weather is kind of harsh there. The site proves the site provides good power generation for peak usage. Also, it has improved the surrounding area's natural landscape. The plants grew back again, which formed the wall to block the strong wind. Then the abandoned salt garden in Tainan. 
After we built a solar power farm here, we left a piece of land for the protection of local bird flocks. The seabirds coexist with the panel structures. The panels provide shades for those fish which tend to avoid sunshine, and they happen to be main food resource of those seabirds. That's how the coexisting cycle works. Then, yet another example, which lowers the air temperature for classrooms. Usually speaking, the classroom situated at top floor can be really hot during summer, for the sunshine shines upon the roof directly. People have been trying to lower down the temperature, but the attempts have failed, until they found out that the rooftops with solar panels can effectively lower the temperature. For this reason, the Ministry of Education started to advise schools to collaborate with solar power companies. Solar power business requires a huge network for power transmission. Here in Taiwan, there is a regulation restricting that a single power using place can only have one type of electric meter. The exception is air conditioners. The extra electric meter and cables made it convenient for solar panels to deliver power. The solar power company gives the schools commissions. The schools can use that money to, pur to purchase air conditioning systems, also pay for electricity bills. It's a nice collaboration which benefits both. Then, there's another example like this. The power farms on offshore islands. This example is about Gupo Island. This is the Gupo Island, a really beautiful place, a tiny and remote uninhabited island. The major resource of Gupo Island are its precious seaweeds. Every year during the Lunar New Year time, the island would be open to neighboring villagers to harvest the seaweeds. During the harvest, those villagers need to stay on, uh, on the island for a few days. Since it's just a few days per year, in the past they used diesel generators as their power supplies. When you leave the diesel generators on the island for most of the time of the year, the equipment can go bad real quick. The solution to this is solar power. They store the power generated by the panels, and they used better materials for the structures, which is stainless steel with waterproof paintings. This method has been working for over three years now without any defect to the equipment. This proves our opinion mentioned before. If you put some innovative idea into it, the repay would be far greater. After the efficiency evaluation part, now let's talk about the maintenance procedure. What are the main points and what are the major problems? First of all, when you see a malfunction, is it really malfunctioning? When you see a converter malfunctioning, is it because the converter itself was poorly designed? Actually, it may not be the case. Sometimes the real problem is with the system's designing. For example, this row of equipment looks pretty well organized, isn't it? Yet the hot wind dissipated from one machine can be sucked into the next one, causing malfunctions. Another example. You can see that the box is installed right by a pillar, which blocks the venting outlet, also causing severe future damage to the box. Then, the way how you arrange the panels. You may ask, isn't it either going vertically or horizontally and that's all? That's correct, but missing the important factor, the angle of the panels. 
During the early stage of solar power development, there was a theory that during summer, to maximize the power generation, we should let the sunshine hit the panels directly, which means to let the panels directly facing the light. After years of practicing, this theory was proved to be very wrong. Why? To maximize the generation, the panels had been set facing north, which causes shadowing upon themselves during winter. You might think that power generation during winter time is low anyway, but the statics say the other way, prove those north facing sides are failures. Now, speaking of arranging them vertically or horizontally, what's the difference? The decisions are made according to the surrounding object. If the obstacles are situated on the shorter side of the arrangement, do not put your panels vertically, for the shadow can cover the whole row at once. Then, regarding the maintenance, there is one very important tool, the thermal imager. Sometimes the malfunctions can't be spotted with bare eyes. We need such tool to do the observation. If you don't have a thermal imager, at least you must have an electric contact thermometer. These tools are more for construction errors. So why is the contact point overheating? Most people would say it is because the designing didn't contain sufficient wires, yet that is not the real problem. The real problem is that the contact points are loose. Why would they, why would they loosen up? Usually due to thermal expansion. The other reasons can be construction errors, for example. Some workers don't care about using correct tools to cut the cables which may leave the cut uneven and eventually lead to fire. This is why we must use the correct tools for maintenance. That was the tool requirement for regular maintenance works. Then what about the emer emergencies? The most common emergency work is to put out fire. Here I'm about to show you the specific guidance set by the authority about how to deal with arson incidents at solar power site. It listed out the required equipment in details, including tools, protection wares, and how to do it. For example, the angle and distance when you need to use water to put it off. Usually we use chemical methods like powders. We must pay serious attention to the standard procedure when dealing with emergencies. Otherwise, it is very likely for workers to get injured, for it can be very dangerous. The power system is a very delicate thing. If you don't deal with it carefully, it can go all down south real quick, like when building blocks collapse. For example, once a worker tried to shut down the whole system by cutting off the electricity, then despite he didn't get electrified yet, his hands got burned by the high voltage electricity shooting out. Another important concept, do not use new parts to test if the system is malfunctioning. It usually goes like your new part go, got destroyed by the malfunctioning system. What do we do then? Take the malfunctioned part to a regularly functioned system. I'm very grateful for this precious opportunity to induce, to introduce our maintenance work. I'm manager Cho from the recycled energy department. The most important role in the system is of course the panels. Each panel can generate about 40 volts of electricity when exposed to sunshine. Then the output goes through PV cables to inverter, changing it from DC to AC current, then goes into public networks through converters and distribution boards. 
Then, we use all kinds of remote surveillance equipment like solar emitter, PLC, EO converter, and all sorts of sensors to remotely oversee the system. Now, let's get into our experiences in maintenance work. Most of the routine checks are outsourced. What we do ourselves are mainly dealing with the emergency situations such as uh, breaker trips. We fix it as soon as possible for the power output goes back to normal. Then, regarding the routine works, we outsource the panel cleaning, site mowing, structure check, etc. Then, we do this maintenance work for of the following equipment ourselves current controller voltage transformer and converter all sorts of meters sensors AC and DC equipment ground wire and air conditioners our current strategy is to build the ability in doing maintenance work and to control the core know-how then I'm going to share the three major malfunctioning situations. 1. Sensor system errors, 30%. The potential reasons to such malfunction are the errors of UPS system, optical fiber transducer, broken optical fibers, usually beaten by rats, on-site sensors, internet connection, communication modules and the error in designing which leads to water leakage 2. Ground wire errors 20% The potential reasons to such malfunction are the MC4 connector of new build site got intruded by sand or other stuffs because the construction was not careful enough Panels swelled and broken, which leads water into it and cause the tripping of PV cells, which leads to overheat. Defect on the insulation parts of P PV cables. Electricity leakage of optimizer. Improper connection between MC4 and PV cable, which leads to melting and other defects to MC4. 3. Inverter malfunctions, 10%. The potential reasons to such malfunction are the errors of string inverter and central inverter. Our advice is to add power storage system to ease the pressure of the network. This side is kind of different from others. Usually, each inverter of 30 kilowatts would have its own PV box. Yet here we connect dozens of PV box to one inverter of 500 kilowatts. The basic structure is the same. It has breaker, fuses, and STD. These are all basic equipment. It separates the loops into positive and negative. Could you share your experience regarding the most frequent errors you have in maintenance work? Generally speaking, the fuses are the most frequently malfunctioning part, for they are expendables. Usually when there is signal indicating error, we check if the operating current is working normally. If it is not working, then we check if the fuses are burnt. This is the most frequent situation we encounter. Regarding the other errors, it depends. There are a lot of situations. Usually, people tend to neglect the electromechanical devices when doing maintenance. The structural system is one of the most important part in our maintenance work. For here in Taiwan, we often face natural disasters such as typhoons, which damages the structure. Apart from the electromechanical devices, we, open ch we often check if the screws are loosened. 
It's 20th of July today. There is a typhoon coming on 24th. That is why today we're here to check if everything's in their place. Every year from June to September is the harsh testing ground season for our solar power farms, which refers to typhoons. Wind disasters are the major threat for our panels. That's why the structural strength is the most important thing. I would like to ask about what do you think is the most important factor regarding the power site maintenance? After we collect all our data, there are specific personnel taking care of data analysis. Usually when you have numerous sites under your business, it's hard for you to always keep an eye on their situation. Hence, we need automatic surveillance system to tell us when things go wrong and to analyze the data. The database generally looks like this. All numbers listed out as a list. We compare the ESH value of a whole area. The data collected by all our sensors would be integrated and sent to this platform we're looking at. And the complicated data would be simplified into user-friendly charts. The most important data is exactly the EHS. Okay. Is there any other advices you would give regarding the routine maintenance work? This depends on how big your business is. If it has reached a certain level, naturally you need planned routine checks per week, per month or even season. I would suggest you to divide your sites into different group of areas, apply different maintenance schedule to each of them, and observe which one is the most efficient. Also, you need to pay attention to different specifications of different sites and make customized plans for them. Now I would like to share some cases. For example, do we really need specific tools to remove the DC connectors? You can see that on the left one, it wasn't removed by specific tool. Hence the damage and loose. This would lead to overheating. Another case, does MC4 really need to be connected so tightly? The manufacturer's device is that you just need to connect it firmly, not necessarily tight. Yet according to my experience, it's made of rubber. If you don't use tool to tighten it, it will loosen after some time. Also, how tight should we apply the screws? If the torque of your tool is adjustable, I suggest you adjust it to 20 kilograms. Also, the choosing of different type of screws to match your need is vital. Do the cables need to be covered completely? I would suggest you to do it as much as possible since the cables are popular attack targets for rats. Rats often got attracted by the smell of wires and then bite them open. How often should we wash the panels? It depends on the situation of your size and your power generation rate. Taiwan is an island surrounded by sea. 98% of the energy we need are imported. Hence, it is vital for our country to develop our own power generation methods. The Thai power is very keen in promoting the development in green energy. In 2019, the Zhangbin Solar Energy Farm is built. The capacity is 100 million watts. And the Tainan Solar Power Farm was inaugurated in 2020 with the capacity of 150 million watts. These are the examples of mega solar power farms constructed in recent years. Take Zhangbin site for example. The area covers 140 hectares of land 
and contains 340,000 panels. To maximize the generating efficiency, we need to rely on the latest technology to maintain it. Through the AI surveillance platform, we have access to live status of each panel module. Should any error occur, the system would immediately inform the staffs, and they will assign engineers to tackle the problems. Aside from making sure the sites are working regularly, the huge database also serves for future error prediction. In recent years, the drones are used widely in various aspects, and Thai Power also implemented this method into their maintenance work. First, they set dozens of coordinate points in their site for the drones to be able to position itself. Then they set the drones up to the sky to fly around and take aerial view pictures of solar panels. The thermal imagery pictures would be sent back to the computer combined into one and then it is cleared to spot overheated panels which are likely to be damaged. With this assistance of drones and AI systems, the maintenance become more efficient and less personnel are required. Taiwanese green energy technology enjoyed significant progress in recent years and become a popular investment project. On this basis, we predict that by 2025, green energy would cover 20% of our total energy usage and Taiwan would become the center of green energy in Asia-Pacific area. As we've seen in the video, regarding how often we need to clean the panels, it relies on long-term data analysis and experiences to determine the schedule. Another common problem is that our devices often got isolated. When this situation happens, we just need to find out the reason. Now we're looking at some common disasters which cause problems to the solar power farms. For example, typhoons damage the structure and panels, wild grass and weeds cause shading and hot spots on panels and sometimes got stuck when you close the box up, wires going above and trees around the panels also cause shadows, bird droppings and dust cover the panels and lower the efficiency. This is how the site may look like after a typhoon disaster. As you can see that some panels got torn down from the structure. Sometimes we need a supported beam on top to prevent such incident from happening. The picture is the site I visit is in Eswatini. They didn't put that beam on top, so the panels got destroyed. In conclusion, surveillance system is absolutely vital for solar power farms, and it has to be user-friendly for people to easily keep track on overseeing the devices. Solar power has become a high-tech, low-cost option of green energy. Whole power experience can be shared around the globe. So, this is the end of our course. This is my contact information. Should you have any doubts or questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much for your attention.